Okay, so this is a review of what we were talking about on Wednesday. This is what a typical water wet relative permeability curve looks like. And I mentioned this last time is that the relative permeability will be zero when the, um, when the water saturation is equal to the residual or irreducible water saturation and then increases nonlinearly as water saturation increases. Uh, that number, um, when you get to the residual oil saturation or SW is equal to one minus SOR, um, you will reach a, an endpoint relative permeability of water, which is the KRW naught that I have written there. That number for a water wet medium is always going to be significantly less than one. And that's because even though the water saturation is quite high, it is uh, occupying the smallest pores and the least permeable pores. The oil relative permeability when you're at residual oil saturation, so SW is equal to 0.8 in this particular case, the, uh, the oil does not move. That's what residual saturation means. It means that it's not zero, but what is there is capillary trapped. And you learned about capillary pressure and interfacial tension in Dr. Sharma's class. And in that, uh, and so when it's capillary tracked, it doesn't move, it's immobile. That makes the relative permeability zero. But as the water saturation decreases or the oil saturation increases, the relative permeability becomes finite and then increases. And eventually when you get all the way down to irreducible water saturation, then your oil relative permeability is high. In this case, it's close to one. And that is because it's a water wet medium and the 80% or so of the saturation that's oil is in those biggest, most permeable pores. So the water that is there isn't really affecting relative permeability. Uh, so um, that is, this is what a typical water wet relative permeability curve would look like. If it was oil wet, then maybe it'd be flipped. If it was intermediate wet, then maybe the endpoint relative permeabilities would be somewhere in between like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So there are some empirical models of relative permeability. Uh, so what we normally do is we do experiments. And um, from those experiments, we fit the data to these equations. And they sort of look like power laws, right? So it's like y is equal to ax to the b or something. But relative permeability is equal to the endpoint, which you could just read off the plot, times a normalized saturation to some exponent. Likewise, the relative oil permeability is the endpoint relative oil permeability times one minus the normalized saturation to an exponent. In general, these exponents will be different. What is this normalized saturation? It's not the same as water saturation, but it's related. So the normalized saturation is defined this way. And it's defined in such a way that if SW is equal to the residual water saturation, then S is equal to zero. And likewise, if SW is equal to one minus the residual oil saturation, S is equal to one. So it, you can have water saturations below residual or above one minus SOR, but this bounds it to where when SW is equal to SWR, S is zero. And when SW is equal to one minus SOR, S is one. Uh, these um, coefficients, NW and NO, are, are greater than one, and they're usually between two and three. Um, in general, they're not equal to each other, although I, I have an example problem later today where they are equal to each other, but in general, that's not the case. So these are, are nice expressions that describe relative permeability. There are more complicated ones that people have developed but uh, these are the most popular and, and for our purposes, they'll be more than sufficient. So let's recall multi, multi-phase Darcy's law. And this is something we did last time. So the water velocity 
is given by Darcy's law on the left and the oil velocity on the right. Uh, it does include relative permeabilities. That's what makes it a multi-phase form of Darcy's law. It does include gravity. This is a 1D equation, but it does include a dip angle of alpha. And then um, if we want to be very general about it, PW is not necessarily equal to PO. The difference is the capillary pressure. Although I have an example later today that um, I'll say that the capillary pressure is zero. If we re rearrange these equations, it's just some algebra and basically just multiply by the viscosity and divide by the permeability and relative permeability, then the equations look like this for water and oil. Okay, so that's just a little bit of algebra and moving some things around. And then what we can do is we can subtract the two equations. We can subtract the top equation from the bottom equation. You could do it the other way around. There was a question about that on Wednesday, but um, that's what I've done here. Now, if I do that subtraction, you're left with this equation. So what you have is this, and, and the reason why this comes first is because you've got a negative minus a negative. So that's a positive. So that's why you get this term here minus the oil term that includes the velocity, viscosity, permeability, and relative permeability. If you have DPO dx minus DPW dx, then you could write it like this, and this is going to be the capillary pressure. And then you get an oil density minus the water density times the gravitational constant times the sine of your dip angle. And if you want to make it even simpler, you can write this equation this way, where now I've substituted PO minus PW is equal to capillary pressure, and I've substituted PW minus PO is equal to the delta of the density. Um, and that's important. I should, I'm, I'm going to reiterate that that delta rho is not rho oil minus rho w, but it's rho w minus rho o, which is why this positive sign became a negative. Now that's just convention. I could have, I could have defined delta rho as PW, PO minus PW, but the reason why we do it this way is the water density is almost always greater than the oil density, right? We know that water is more dense than oil. And that just makes delta rho positive, but then this makes this negative in front of there. So now we got this equation. We're going to use it for fractional flow. And I've rewritten the equation up here in the upper right hand corner just so we can remember it. But uh, what fractional flow is, is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's the fraction of the flow that's a certain phase. So, the fractional flow of phase J is the velocity of phase J divided by the total velocity. So then the fractional flow of water is UW divided by U, and the fractional flow of oil is UO divided by U. Or if you have multiple phases, um, if you have, well, if you have two phases, three phases, however many phases you have, the sum of all fractional flows is equal to one. So the fractional flow of water, if you have two phases, water and oil, and the fractional flow of water is 0.7, and then you know that the fractional flow of oil is 0.3. Likewise, the sum of velocities of all phases is equal to U, the total velocity. So if the water velocity is one foot per day and the velocity of oil is two feet per day, then the total velocity is three feet per day. One thing I will point out, and we'll come to this at the end of the class probably, is, is that the fractional flows, even though they sum up to one, they individually could be greater than one or less than zero. So one of them could be FW is 1.3, and then FO would be minus 0.3. So then 1.3 plus a negative 0.3 is still one. That seems a little weird, and I'm going to explain why you can have positive, you can have values above one or negative, and it's related to gravity. But if, if I use this definition here and I substitute that into the equation I have in the upper right hand corner, so UW is just FW times the total velocity, and 
UO is the total velocity times FO or one minus FW because I've only got oil and water, then this equation in the upper right hand corner becomes the one I've got written here. And now this just becomes an algebra assignment. So if, if you don't quite follow what I show next, I recommend you spend, I don't know, three to five minutes after class just trying to take this equation and solving for FW. But that's all it is. It's, you know, group like terms, you know, move FW by itself, move everything over to the right hand side. And what you get is an equation that looks like this. Okay. So the fractional flow of water is equal to one plus this permeability times relative permeability divided by velocity, viscosity times this capillary pressure gradient minus this gravity term divided by one plus this term over here, which um, is actually what, what I'm gonna refer to later as an inverse mobility ratio. So um, this is a little complicated, okay? What it tells us is that if you wanted to know what percent of the flow is water, the fractional flow of water versus oil, you would have to know Things like the permeability, the relative permeability, the total velocity, the viscosity, the capillary pressure gradient, dip angle, density dif difference, et cetera. Okay. But, you know, those are all things that we would normally know. So you plug that in and calculate the fractional flow of water. And this is important, right? Because you would want to know in a reservoir what percent of your water, of the flow is the water and what percent is oil. And, and of course the percent that's oil is one minus FW. This is especially true of the well bore, although it's true everywhere you'd wanna know that. Um, this is related to the water cut. So if you were producing, and I told you you're gonna produce a thousand barrels per day, you would wanna know what percent of that thousand barrels is oil versus water. If it was 90% oil, you'd say, well, that's great. If it was 99% water, well, you'd tell me that's terrible, right? So that, that's important to know. It's not just how much flow there is, but what percent of it is oil. You can simplify this in the special case where capillary pressure is zero and gravity is zero. So the dip angle is zero or, or the densities are equal, but, but usually the dip angle is zero. If that's the case, then this equation simplifies this way. And that's a much simpler equation. So if you know the fluid viscosities and you know the relative permeabilities, then you can plug it in and get that. Um, sometimes we call KRO over mu O the mobility of the oil phase. And we call KRW over mu W the mobility of the water phase. And that's what I've defined over here. And um, just this is coming up on the next slide or the one after it is that the mobility of the water phase divided by the mobility of the oil phase is called the mobility ratio or M. So uh, before I move on to the next slide, are there any questions about this? Okay, well, if you think of anything, then just stop me or send something into the chat. Okay, so uh, what does fractional flow look like? Well, on the left over here is the um, relative permeability curve. And it's the same one we showed over there, although there's a typo in the legend, it should be oil and water. Um, but um, this is the relative permeability curves and they are functions of saturation. And fractional flow, which is the water velocity divided by the total velocity, is a function of relative permeability in a few different places. And since relative permeability is a function of saturation, clearly fractional flow is a function of saturation. And if you were to plot fractional flow, FW versus water saturation, SW, it might look something like this, okay? And when the relative permeability, KRW is zero, like it is here, then the fractional flow is gonna be zero as well. And that makes sense, right? Because 
relative permeability tells you um, if it's zero, then that means it's not moving, that water is not moving. That's by definition. And if the water is not moving, then the fraction of the flow that's water is going to be zero. So the fractional flow of water is zero at the residual water saturation. Then it's going to start to increase as water saturation increases. So there'll always be an inflection point. And then when you get all the way to one minus the residual oil saturation, then oil doesn't move, right? Right over here, we saw the relative permeability of oil was zero. And if oil doesn't move, then the fractional flow of oil is zero, which means the fractional flow of water is, is one or 100%. Okay. And the shape of this curve is gonna depend on a lot of things. And I'm going to show you that in, in the next couple of slides. It'll depend on the mobility ratio. It'll depend on how important gravity is. Those kinds of things. But, but this is a typical shape of a fractional flow curve. The other thing that we're going to need later on in this semester is the derivative of the fractional flow curve. The derivative of this curve is a slope of the line tangent to the curve. And it's different at every saturation. So DFW, DSW, or FW prime will be a function of saturation as well. And I will show that cur curve on the very last slide. Any questions about this? Okay, well, uh, I'm next gonna introduce a few dimensionless variables. We've already been dealing with dimensionless variables in the aquifer models. We're gonna introduce some more and we're gonna be using dimensionless variables a lot. So as engineers, we love dimensionless variables because it allows us to plot things and it allows us to kind of describe things and understand them in a more general sense, so that they apply for any reservoir and any, any fluid conditions. Uh, you know, otherwise we'd have an infinite number of combinations of things we could do. This, this kind of reduces that. So the mobility ratio I, I defined earlier as the mobility of water divided by the mobility of oil. And um, that can be written as KRW times the oil viscosity divided by the relative permeability of oil times the water viscosity. So that's a ratio. It could be less than one or it could be really large, right? So um, it's gonna be, a, but it, it won't be negative. It's a positive number over a positive number. There's another rate related ratio we have, which is the endpoint mobility ratio. And that's the same thing, except that it uses the relative permeability at the endpoints. Remember that the endpoints are when um, SW is equal to SWR, that gives us KRO naught. And when SW is equal to one minus SOR, that gives us KRW naught. We call that the endpoint mobility ratio. And we just use the variable M with the superscript naught or zero there. Then there's another uh, dimensionless number we talk about, which is the gravity number. Not surprisingly, that involves the use of gravity and it's a ratio of gravitational forces divided by viscosity forces. And, and you, you, you all have seen these types of dimensionless numbers before in your transport class, you learned about the Reynolds number, which is the ratio of uh, inertial to viscous forces. And you learned about capillary, you know, the capillary number, which is a ratio of, of forces. This is the gravity number. And on the top, you've got the effect of gravity, which not surprisingly, you've got the difference in densities. So hypothetically, if oil and water had the same density, then that numerator would be zero and you, you'd have no effect of gravity. But if the water density is much higher than the oil density, then that number could be big. 
And you can see that also in the numerator is the permeability and the endpoint relative permeability. On the denominator is the velocity and the viscosity. So if you've got a very viscous fluid or you've got a very high velocity, then the gravity number is going to be small, which effectively means we can ignore gravity, right? So if the gravity number is super small, like much less than one, then you can ignore it. But if it's close to one or greater than it, then you can't ignore it. So if I take my um, fractional flow equation that I had on the previous slide, and, and then I recall my Cori um, model for relative permeability, which is here, then I can substitute some of these dimensionless terms, M naught, NG naught, and, um, and S, into my equation and, and you know I'll if you're not quite sure where that comes from then you can spend a few minutes after class trying to reproduce that but it's pretty straightforward if you just plug in m naught into I'll go into here and and you do a little algebra on the numerator then what you learn is that you can write the fractional flow equation this way, I think that this, uh, yeah, and this this does not include capillary pressure. So DPC DX is zero. And if you were to plot the fractional flow versus water saturation at different endpoint mobility ratios, 0.1, 1, 1, and 10, you would get curves that look like this. And here I should say that the dip angle is zero. I'm gonna show some plots later where the dip angle is not zero. But these are what typical fractional flow plots look like. And these are at different endpoint mobility ratios. And again, this is super generic because um, if alpha is zero, then this whole term goes away. And, and this is, this, this, these curves work for almost any combination of fluids and rates and stuff like that. So that's why we like our dimensionless variables. But let's, let's think about this a little bit. When the water saturation is 0.2, the residual water saturation, the fractional flow of water is always zero. It doesn't matter what the mobility ratio is. Water doesn't move and it's zero. And then when it's one minus SOR, it's 100%. But in between is a little bit different. So take 0.4, for example. If the mobility ratio is high, Okay, and a high mobility ratio basically means that um, that um, KRW mu O or KRO mu W is, is large. So if you come over to M naught is 10, then the fractional flow of water is really big. That sort of makes sense because what that means is that the relative permeability of water is big or the water viscosity is small and that makes it easier for water to flow. So the fractional flow of water at 0.4 is like 0.7, but if you had a mobility ratio of 10, that would be like a, um, that would make it easier for oil to flow than water, in which case the fractional flow of water is really small. It's like 0.05 or even lower than that. So that makes a big difference. Makes a big difference in the mobility ratio is. And on your next homework, number four, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is to write a little code to, to make some of these plots. And um, what I mentioned in the email is, is that it may seem like writing code isn't going to be helpful for the exam because I've already told you you won't have to do that on the exam, write any code. But I do think that the practice of creating and investigating these fractional flow curves could be helpful for studying for the exam. Uh, 1D reservoir with a dip angle of zero degrees. That just means it's flat, okay? And it means we don't have to worry about gravity, which is gonna make this problem a little simpler. Um, it's saturated with both oil and water, so there's no gas. And, and we probably won't be dealing with gas for a while. So most of the time we'll have oil and water. Relative permeability curves are defined, described by this Corey Brooks model with those residual saturations, endpoint ratios, and exponents. The water and oil viscosity are two centipoise and one centipoise, respectively. The pressure gradient is one PSI per foot. 
and capillary pressure can be neglected. So the, the, I'll give you a hint. The first three calculations aren't going to require any calculations. You don't need a calculator and you don't really need a pencil. What you need is, is to think so, um, and maybe to look at the, think about the plot. So um, my first question is, would you describe this rock as water wet, intermediate wet, or oil wet, and why? So think about that for a minute based on the parameters I gave you in the problem. Um, so yes, it, it is water wet, and um, you probably have the reason correct, although I didn't quite follow it, but it's basically because the endpoint relative permeability of oil is so much greater than water, then I know it's water wet, okay? Because what that's telling me is that water is occupying the small, low permeability pores, and the oil is occupying the bigger pores. So this must be a water wet medium. If it was flipped, you know, and it didn't have to be one, right? I mean, it could be, um, you know, 0.3 and 0.9, and I would still say it's water wet. But if it was flipped and KRW naught was 0.9 and KRO was 0.3, then I would say that's oil wet. And then if they were both kind of in the 0.4 to 0.6 range, you know, I'd probably say that uh, they were, it was intermediate wet or mixed wet. So, so good job. Um, second question. If the water saturation is 20%, what is the relative permeability of both water and oil? What is the fractional flow of water and oil? And what is the velocity of water? That is correct. So relative permeability of water is zero because we're residual water saturation. Relative permeability of oil is equal to the endpoint relative permeability of oil, which is one. And again, because water is not moving, fractional flow of water has to be zero. And then the, the fractional flow of oil has to be one minus FW, so that's one, it's 100%. So, so good. And we're gonna skip the question about the velocity of water. So part C, if the water saturation is 70%, what is the relative permeability of water and oil? And what is the fractional flow of water and oil? So, if the water saturation is 70%, that means the oil saturation is 30%. If the oil saturation is 30%, then that's at residual oil saturation, so oil is not moving. So the relative permeability of oil would be zero. The water saturation is one minus SOR, and so that's going to be equal to KRW naught, which is 0.2 or 20%. Right. Now the fractional flow of oil is going to be zero because oil is not moving. It's at residual oil saturation. And then the fractional flow of water is one minus that. So it's it's one or hundred percent. Everybody follow that? Okay, so um this one's a, a little tougher and um, well, I, might, I might give you five minutes to four minutes to work on it. So the water saturation is 50%. What is the relative permeability of water and oil? This one's gonna involve a calculation. So what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to calculate the normalized saturation S then you're gonna to have to use the Cori equations to compute the relative permeabilities. What I did is I calculated the normalized saturation, which is the water saturation minus the residual water saturation divided by one minus SWR minus SOR. SW is 50%, SWR is 20%, and SOR is 30%. So I got 0.6, is that what you all got? Okay, then I took S and I plugged it into my Cori equations. So KRW is KRW naught times S to NW. 
and W is 2. KRW naught is 0.2, so I get 0 0.072. And what KRO is, plugging those values in, I get 0.16. Anybody else get those same numbers? So uh, one thing to note here is that KRW and KRO are both below one. That's not surprising. Um, also, KRW plus KRO is less than one. It's really significantly less than low, right? So you add the two together, you get about 0.23. What that means is that when you have oil and water together, that the effective permeability is only 25%-ish. Maybe, maybe less than that of what would be just a single phase permeability. So that's what happens when you put more than one phase together, they, they interact and, and they make it even harder to flow. Um, questions about that? So the next question was is to compute the mobility ratio. We got KRW and KRO, we're given the viscosity, so calculate M, the mobility ratio. We could have calculated the endpoint mobility ratio as well, but I didn't ask for that. So just the mobility ratio M. So I got um, M is 0.072 times two centipoise divided by 0.16, that was the relative permeability of oil times one centipoise. And I got a mobility ratio of 0.9. So that's M. And then the next question was is that, uh, what is the fractional flow of water and oil? So uh, I'll just kind of show you that since we're running out of time here. But the fractional flow, well, that's an ugly equation there that we had, and we could use that one. But I told you capillary pressure is zero, so this goes away. And I told you the dip angle is zero and the sine of zero is zero. So this whole term goes away. So then you're left with one over one plus this term here. And this term here is just one over the mobility ratio. So then the um, fractional flow of water is one divided by one plus one over 0.9, which is 0.473. And the fractional flow of oil is just one minus that, which is 0.527. So that means that 47% of the flow is water and 53% is oil.